So one of my favorite quotes from military history is by General Ferdinand Foch, the supreme allied commander of World War I, who said that airplanes are interesting toys, but of no military value whatsoever. With 100 years of hindsight, we can look back at quotes like this and share a laugh at how bad people can be, at seeing how new technologies are going to change the future of warfare. But what if there's technologies around us today that we think about in the same vein? What if we're just as guilty as General Foch was at seeing how new technologies are going to change the nature of national defense? I believe that's exactly what's happening now with this new technology called Bitcoin. Instead of being a new form of money or a new financial payment system, I believe that it would be more accurate to describe Bitcoin as a new type of cyber warfighting technology, and I think it's going to become critical to national defense. Sounds crazy, right? Bitcoin's interesting technology, but of no military value, right? Well, before you go all Ferdinand Foch on me, please just indulge me, indulge me for a second and let me explain my reasoning. If you study nature, you'll notice that animals, practically all of them, secure their resources the same way, by using physical power. Whether they're trying to defend their access to their territory or their food, they do it by projecting power to physically constrain other animals. Nature's top survivors have been genetically optimized to do this. They evolve increasingly clever ways to project power and impose physical constraints, impose physically prohibitive costs on their other animals to secure their resources to defend their freedom of action. And if you study humans, in our society, you'll see that we behave the exact same way. We also use physical power to defend our resources and to secure our freedom of action in every domain. So, for example, if we want to defend our, our access to the land, we develop technologies to project power in from through land to physically constrain people or impose physically prohibitive costs on any belligerent actor who would try to deny our access to the land. And these same principles hold true for when civilization expands its footprint into other domains, like the sea, or the air, or space. It turns out that security works the same way in every domain. If you want to secure your resources in that domain, you must project power in and from and through it. And as a complex emergent benefit of all these societies competing against each other in this grand scale physical power competition, control over our resources remains decentralized. You'll note that no single person or polity has ever been able to gain or maintain unimpeachable centralized control over all of the land, all of the sea, all of our air, all of our space. For as long as human civilization has existed, we've been constantly engaged in this physical power competition to decentralize control over these resources. We even have a special name for this protocol. It's called warfare. So what happens when human civilization expands its footprint into this fifth domain of cyberspace? What happens when human civilization starts to value a new resource in this domain called data? How do we secure access to our data? How do we decentralize control over our data? How do we defend our freedom of action in this domain? Why wouldn't we expect to do it the same way we do it in every other domain? Why wouldn't we expect people to project power, physical power, to secure their cyber resources? Is cyberspace some kind of special exception to this very well-established trend in cybersecurity, or are we overlooking something? It seems to me like there's a missing piece of the puzzle. We use physical power to defend our resources in every domain, except cyberspace. Why? For some inexplicable reason, when we try to secure our cyber resources, like our data or our information, or our software, we keep on trying to rely exclusively on encoded logic. So instead of trying to use physical power to physically constrain or impose physically prohibitive costs on cyber attackers, computer scientists keep on acting like there's some magical combination of if, then, and else statements that will keep us secure. And not surprisingly, it doesn't work very well. 
The third largest economy behind the United States and China is the black market digital economy of cybercrime. It turns out that if you want to keep your software secure against the systemic exploitation of its encoded logic using nothing but encoded logic, it's a demonstrably ineffective cybersecurity strategy. But recently, over the past 13 years, a new group of people have emerged and shown that it's possible to secure software without relying exclusively on encoded logic. They've shown us that it's possible to use physical power to secure our resources, to decentralize control over our resources. And they've done it the same way that we do it in every other domain, by physically constraining the bad guys, by imposing physically prohibitive costs on the bad guys, using this new technology they call proof of work. But how do you physically constrain bad guys in cyberspace? Isn't cyberspace some kind of non-physical domain? So how does that work? Answer to that question is actually really easy. All you have to do to physically constrain bad guys in cyberspace is physically constrain their computer. And to do that, you just really need to build a physically constrained computer and make them use it. So what do I mean by that? Let's start with the first general purpose computer built in the 1940s. Over the past 80 years, our computer engineers have been trying to shrink the size and energy consumption of our computers to make them physically easier to operate. As a result of this design practice, we now have microchips. But if you wanted to make a physically constrained computer, you would have to reverse optimize this design strategy. And you'd have to march in the opposite direction. So instead of a microchip, you'd have to build a macrochip. How do you build a macrochip? Turns out the infrastructure that you would need to build the macrochip, that is the circuitry that you would need to build the largest and most energy intensive computer ever is already in place in the form of our global electric power grid. The global electric power grid is huge, so big that no single nation can control it. The global electric power grid uses a lot of energy, so much so that no single nation can power it. But at the end of the day, the global electric power grid is a bunch of electricity passing across a bunch of wires. It's the same exact technology that's in our computers, except it's been reverse optimized. It's physically expensive to operate. So from a computer science perspective, it'd be really easy to convert the global electric power grid into a giant physically, to op physically expensive to operate computer. All you would have to do is apply Boolean logic to the power, build some kind of converter to convert watts into bits of information that can pass across the internet. And guess what? That converter's already built. It's already been adopted. It's already scaled globally. That technology is called Bitcoin. Bitcoin converts our global electric power grid into a giant physically expensive computer and then uses it to secure data and messages passing across the internet. Bitcoin is special because it secures this data not by relying exclusively on encoded logic, but instead by tapping into the physical constraints of the power grid to physically constrain the bad guys trying to use it. Bitcoin also decentralizes control over this data by enabling people to compete in a global scale physical power competition for that control. Sound familiar? Bitcoin satisfies the same function as the other warfighting technologies that we use in these other domains, but it takes a different form that we haven't seen before. It's the same game, but in a different domain. So if you combine all these concepts together, we can see that Bitcoin could be the missing piece of this puzzle. Of all people, Bitcoiners have figured out how to project power in, from, and through cyberspace. Bitcoiners have figured out how to secure data, decentralize data, preserve freedom of action in cyberspace. That doesn't sound like just a monetary technology to me, folks. That sounds like a cyber warfighting technology, a cybersecurity technology, a cyber defense technology. Maybe nations will use it to do defense differently in the future. I think that we may be at the dawn of a new age of digital power projection as humanity expands its footprint into cyberspace. I think this technology is going to become critical, that nations are going to rely on it 
to secure their cyberspace, just like they rely on airplanes to secure their airspace. And I think most people in this room don't get it yet because they think it's just the coin. They think maybe, at best, that it's interesting technology, but of no military value whatsoever. Ironically, here's the, here's the ironic part about this. This has happened before. For hundreds of years, the Chinese alchemists who invented black powder thought it was just medicine. It took centuries for people to figure out that black powder was useful for way more than just medicine, that it would change the game of national security. They say that history doesn't repeat. They say that it echoes. I think history is echoing right now with this new technology that people think is just a coin. So if I'm right, if this really is a military-grade technology, then we're already in the space race. It's already a cyberspace race. And as JFK said, the exploration of this domain will go forward whether we participate in it or not. And no nation that expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race. For this reason, I believe that becoming masters of this cyber power projection technology is, in fact, a US national strategic imperative. I fear that by ignoring this technology or underestimating this technology, that we, the DOD, could be making a huge strategic blunder. And I used to think I was alone in this line of thinking. But then, after my National Defense Fellowship at MIT, after publishing a book on this subject, it became a number one bestseller, top 10 global release. So maybe I'm not alone. And at the same time, I've noticed a dramatic shift in the attitude of our adversaries, a change we can't ignore. Over the last couple of years, China and Russia have done a complete 180 on this technology. They've gone from being super unsupportive of this technology to being super supportive of this technology. They're now the second and third largest players in this industry. I'm concerned that they may have figured this out before we have. I'm concerned that they realize that this is a defense technology, not a monetary technology. And if it's true that this is a defense technology, then that would imply that it's up to the Department of Defense to get us back on track, to lead the national conversation on this, not the Department of Treasury, and especially not the non-government Federal Reserve Bank, the people with the biggest financial conflicts of interest possible. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the DOD can't afford to fosh this up. <laughs> I think we could probably agree that the future of national security is cybersecurity. And I just showed you a new approach to cybersecurity, where people have figured out how to tap into physical power to physically constrain bad guys, to impose physically prohibitive costs on bad guys, all to secure their cyber resources the same exact way that we do it in every other domain. I just showed you this, yet people still don't see it, probably because they're extrapolating from the past, making that same rookie mistake that we've talked about multiple times today of expecting the next war to look like the last war, the next war fighting technology to look like the last war fighting technology. If that's true, then we're no different than the Chinese alchemists who didn't understand the strategic importance of black powder. We're no different than General Foch who didn't understand the significance of airplanes. We have to start taking this technology seriously, not as a monetary technology, but as a cybersecurity technology, a defense technology. We have to start thinking critically about the national strategic implications of Bitcoin. Our nation is counting on us to recognize these trends and to posture this country to be a leader in these defense technologies when they emerge, to be the first, to be the best, before it's too late. And the clock is ticking.
Thank you.